Hello and welcome to Deep Dive with me, Mitali Mukherjee. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, India's longest serving and first Prime Minister and also perhaps an individual who has been greatly debated and discussed both through his life and in his afterlife. In their book, Nehru, The Debates That Defined India, the two authors, Tripur Daman Singh and Adil Hussain, look at what may be up until now unknown facets of the Prime Minister and how the personality might have impacted policy. The book is divided into four parts and takes on four crucial issues ranging from freedom of speech to religion to foreign policy and really lays out a map of his conversation with four outstanding leaders of the time to portray what might have been and what is today uh, the state of India and the state of India's democracy. Both the authors join me now to talk about some of the scratchy bits in the conversations and of course the parts that stood out for them when they started writing this. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining in and um, congratulations on your book. It's raising quite a bit of debate as I can see. But let me start by asking the two of you or if only one of you wants to answer this, why you, why you felt the need to write a book or another book about Nehru. Um, you know, there's just been so much talk, I think, especially since 2014 about this particular prime minister. So I was a bit intrigued about why you chose to tell the story again. No, I think uh, you're absolutely right. There has been a lot of debate, especially since 2014. And that's, um, you know, one of the major reasons why we wrote that, uh, why we wrote this book. Um, is because uh, a lot of what Nehru's ideas were and a lot of, you know, what Nehru really was as a man um, has been covered up by interlocutors and uh, interpreters over, um, especially over the, um, in the last five to six years. And it really, in a way, serves to obfuscate, uh, you know, more than reveal. And we thought through this book, really, we would be able to, you know, let um, the real Nehru, so to say, um, speak for himself and to uh, and to kind of shine a spotlight on 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 his ideas um, in a way that would allow um, a, a more positive debate to be generated rather than um, uh, essentially lay blame or uh, a portion you know a portion blame or or, or praise um, and I think you know maybe if Adil wants to say something he should I actually want to that. Maybe. take that a step forward with you Adil you know what yeah. What is it that you felt was obfuscated? What what particular part of Nehru did you want to shine a light on? Okay, so well, many things. So what what I wanted to say um, before um, um, what I wanted to say initially was that um, if we look at many of the things that are happening in India right now, be it debates around citizenship, be it um, communal tensions that are sort of coming up again, being questions on ownership, who owns sacred properties, etc. So many of that stuff goes back to debates that Nehru was already um, fighting in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and then all the way up to his prime ministership. And what has happened is that Nehru has become a bit of a playball that you just use in order to make specific arguments, right? Regardless of where you stand politically, um, he's been instrumentalized in many ways. And what we try to do with this book is really invite people to revisit those debates. We give brief introductions um, on the historical context in order to um, give people a clue on what, what was happening at the time. And then we leave them very much with the primary material that they can read and then form their own opinions. And that's really what the important thing is and that sets this book apart is that it allows you to form your own opinion. So this is not some kind of um, partisan framing of Nehru in a specific way, but Nehru gets to speak himself directly and then people can draw the own relevance that they see for our time today. Mm. Okay, so for those who you know are perhaps not familiar with your book, you're working through four key pillars and four conversations with four standout leaders of the time, Muhammad Iqbal, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Sadar Patel, and of course, Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Let me ask you both, um, as you went through the material and you studied these uh, interactions, you know, which which one in terms of the tone and tenor was the most surprising to you when you started looking at it in more granular detail? Uh, Tripu Dharman, maybe I could sp start with you on that. Um, I think Iqbal is by far the most uh, surprising and the most interesting. And that's because, um, A, you know, it's it hasn't really been looked at very much um, uh, in, in the past. Most people don't even know that actually Nero and Iqbal 
engaged in a, in a debate of this um, magnitude. And secondly, it's also because Nehru chooses to a engage in a in a debate that's you know very far from uh, his his kind of range of expertise. He goes into essentially Muslim, uh, Islamic theology, uh, and he chooses to engage uh, with someone who he you know who he doesn't really uh, a need to. Um, it's a debate that doesn't isn't at that point directly relevant to him, but but he still does it, and he uh, uh, he chooses to go into it, you know, um, uh, pretty strongly. And I think that's uh, that to us was uh, to, to me especially was was the most surprising. I know Adil has worked on it um, in a lot more detail, but to me that was that was very much it. Adil's smile seems to indicate he concurs. That was that the surprising. No, it, it, for, for for me the the thing about this debate is also that it's the most relevant because it's this debate yeah. that eventually leads to the partition of the Indian subcontinent, right? All of the other debates are relevant in the sense that they shape foreign policy decisions, say vis-a-vis -vis China, um, that shape the way in which the constitution is interpreted. But this is really the crucial debate that splits the continent. So this is the debate about the role of religion in politics, like the fundamental question: What does it mean to have a Muslim identity? And how does one represent that politically? What does religious reform mean? So all of these key questions that come up and explode in the 1940s are really the ones that these two men are sort of having an exchange over. And I also agree with Tripu Dhaman that Nehru sort of dabbles in Islamic theology, something that is far away from his sphere of competence, um, even further than economics, some might even say. Um, but um, here, here is really... Um, he is really um, two people, both of whom are not Islamic the theologians, neither is Iqbal, right? So he's also not um, trained in Islamic law, but essentially he's a poet and he writes moving poetry that sort of, you know, gives people a sense of um, enthusiasm to join specific causes. Um, but he's also not a theologian. And then these two men are trying to figure out um, what it means to be Muslim and what Islamic solidarity means in the early 20th century. So, yeah, I very much agree with Ripu Daman on that. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, let me dive straight into the notes I've got on your book. I'm reading from one of the letters that they exchange, um, where Nehru writes, Sir Muhammad's writings always attract me, for they give me some insight into a world which I find difficult to understand. So far as religion and the religious outlook are concerned, I live in the outer darkness, but in spite of this deficiency in me, I am sufficiently interested in the historical, cultural, and even the philosophical aspects of religion. Adil, you know, let me ask you, since this is something you've dealt with, and you look at it from the lens of the here and now, uh, it seems almost unreal that uh, someone would speak of religion in this almost naive way while, while talking about politics and the state. Um, where do you think that was coming from? I mean, the confidence that Nehru has definitely comes from his upbringing, right? So he's born into this dynastic sort of um, legacy. His father was already a president of the Congress party. He attends um, elite school. So I do think it's a very masculine early 20th century um, male confidence that he has. So whatever the sphere is, he can sort of barge in and ask the most critical questions and sort of also be in a position that he wants the other person to explain it to him, right? So when he's addressing Iqbal, he's saying that this is what I think, but you know, you can correct me and then Iqbal answers. And then he says like, well, um, you haven't really corrected me because my opinion is fully formed, right? So this type of confidence, I do think is a very 20th century, early 20th century elite confidence um, that Nehru depicts. The other thing is that Nehru did have a very wide interest in things. So his interests, so he may not have acquired um, a great amount of depth in any one particular field, but he was interested in history. And that interest um, was something that he shared with Iqbal, because Iqbal also comes from a similar sort of, um, experienced a similar sort of elite upbringing, maybe slightly different because um, his um, early time was spent in a city far removed from the sort of urban centers of um, educational prowess of um, the Indian subcontinent or the UK, but still both of them share like this um, interest that they can debate things that they are not necessarily experts in. Mm. Um, Tripudaman, let me move forward to the next exchange and I know we'll jump back and forth between Nehru and Jinnah. I think this, 
you know, two things struck me as I read it. One, the fact that there were so many and there are so many facets of Jinnah that I think we tend to dilute. Um, mm-hmm. It's very binary for us, you know, he's he's the bad guy or the good guy, depending on which side of the border you're on. And uh, the other that there, there's a truly acerbic tone in the exchanges when, when, when you look at it and you read it between um, Nehru and Jinnah. Tell me what, you know, what you were thinking and and processing while you were going through those exchanges. No, there very much is uh, an acerbic tone as only those two men could have. Uh, you know, it uh, as Lord Wavell used to joke and he wrote quite extensively in his diary about how, um, how different things would have been if only uh, someone apart from Nehru and Jinnah could have uh, negotiated the whole uh, whole issue. So this is there. They tend to rile each other up. And um, I think, you know, you can understand where Jinnah is coming from because the period is, well, he's seen uh, the sort of failure of the Western experiment with democracy in Europe um, in the 1920s uh, and its sort of descent towards uh, towards fascism. Um, they've, he's seen the horrors of the First World War. Uh, he is also... Uh, one must remember a contemporary of uh, Nehru seniors. He's much older than Nehru. He's much more established than Nehru. He doesn't really uh, see any need at that point to take Nehru um, too seriously because for him, Nehru is uh, a bit of an upstart with no real credentials, no qualifications, uh, no, um, uh, no substantial achievement to his name. And then after that, you have the kind of disastrous experiment in UP where they try and form a coalition uh, Molan Azad sort of leads that effort and then Nehru really torpedoes it by saying, you know, if the League wants a coalition, they should uh, just join the Congress. So having seen that and having kind of misgivings anyway about um, how democracy would stack up uh, in India, where you would have a permanent majority and a permanent minority defined by religion, um, you can, you know, you can understand where uh, Jinnah is coming from. And for Nehru, uh, as Adil said, there's the kind of 20th century um, masculinity, but there's also a sense of, uh, you know, coming from an elite background where he feels comfortable enough to write to someone who's, uh, you know, his father's contemporary uh, and already a, a major established leader and says, you know, e- explain your position to me and tell me what you want. And, uh, you know, in letter, um, in your previous letter in point number five, you haven't, ex- you know, I, I don't understand this. Um, and in point number seven, you say this, uh, and you know, but the, so it's it's a very kind of he gets into a very uh, almost lawyer like mode, which is um, what we normally associate uh, uh, with Jinnah. So it 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 kind of exposes the two of them in very um, in a very interesting way. Yeah, um, you know, in fact, as a follow up to that, um, you've written about how he responded and reacted to the Nehru report, where he, you know, really made a strong point about how there needed to be a constitutional safeguard in terms of minority representation, especially in the, you know, the parliamentary process. Um, But it, it wasn't just Nehru, right? He was facing a lot of pushback from pretty much everyone at that point. You know, what does that indicate to you, Tripudaman, about what the mood was at, at that point towards Nehru? Was he very much um, seen as the leader who was taking the strong calls and hence there was a lot of people backing them because this, when, when you read this, it almost seems like a not unreasonable ask. And uh, as you said, perhaps things could have been sorted out differently if it weren't these two individuals in the room. Uh, no, completely true. And also, um, it's important to remember that uh, at this point, uh, A, that there's the, all, the looming figure of Gandhi. Uh, and we often tend to forget that Gandhi was, that all of these relationships in often tended to uh, be almost you know trilateral uh, in in a sort of unstated way because Gandhi loomed very large over um, over all of them, and for Jinnah Gandhi had really in in some senses taken the Congress away from him. He was he was the rising star. Um, he was the one being groomed by people like Gokhale etc. Uh, so for him, a Gandhi has taken uh, the Congress away from him, and for Nehru, Nehru is very much Gandhi's protege. That's part and parcel of what makes him. Uh, and a, a powerful figure in in the Congress. He never really acquires. Uh, he doesn't acquire unchallenged power until you know uh, the early 1950s. So at this point, he 
he has to, it, it, that's the reason that he has to engage with all of these people, because you don't see this kind of engagement post-1952 once he's, you know, won his uh, huge majority and uh, uh, kind of pushed out all his all his challenges. They're either dead or they're out of the Congress. Um, you know, that's that would, that would really be what I what I'd say to that. Yeah. Um, Adil, in fact, you all have pointed out that in this intellectual combat, as you called it, um, he did not even spare Mahatma Gandhi, although he shied away from open confrontation. You know, what um, What strains do you see of that and how tense did it get? I mean, between Nehru and Gandhi, I mean, the thing is, Gandhi is really the figure who heaves Nehru in a position that he is seen by other people to possess leadership potential. So if it wasn't for Gandhi's handpicking of Nehru and trusting him in order to represent the Congress party and you know do negotiations on behalf of the Congress party, Nehru wouldn't have had like the um, majority of the party behind him. So there's a strong element where Nehru is constantly aware that he requires Gandhi. Despite Gandhi's um, antics at times where they go against Nehru's own interest. And um, these things we see in a, a multitude of historical moments. So we see it, for instance, when um, Nehru is trying to negotiate a specific position and then has to double check it with Gandhi, and then Gandhi puts his foot down and then Nehru is sort of caught in the middle. The other thing which is, I do think, crucial in order to sort of decipher their relationship is that um, the same mechanism that Nehru uses in order to... Um, in order to endear himself to Gandhi is the method that doesn't work with Nehru. So when, uh, that doesn't work with Jinnah. So when Nehru writes to Jinnah and says like, I'm your student, please explain to me your position. And, you know, I'm then going to sort of um, look at it and study it very carefully. Then um, Jinnah reacts to it and goes like, why don't you pick up any newspaper and read what's going, what's happened in the last in the past 10 years and then you will understand Hindu Muslim conflict whereas when he asked the same to Gandhi then Gandhi leans back and goes okay let me explain the world to you right so these are very different ways of reacting to essentially the same sort of approach that Nehru has towards people who are his senior in specific positions so I do think that what is like the way in which Nehru is able to endear himself to Gandhi fails brutally and then causes all, all that all that drama that sort of unfolds um, in the late 19 in the late 1940s. Yeah, I think one of those lines saying I have examined the so-called communal question. I think that really indicates, uh, you know, the, the way he went about his communication. Um, Adil, the one which is really front and center right now is his equation with Sadar Patel. I think that's the one that gets debated the most, that's the one that gets sort of pulled to this side or that of uh, the conversation as one chooses. What was your big takeaway of this situation? Because for some people it's, yes, they had differences, but oh, they were so respectful and they were such a great team. And the other was that Sadar Patel never got his his due. He never got to do what he actually wanted. Um, I think the, the the most important takeaway here is, again, it goes back to Gandhi. And the biggest takeaway that I feel that I got from these debates is that um, the, it, it was a sense of relationship mediated through Gandhi. So you had Badil, who was utterly loyal towards Gandhi, so who really believed in the mission of the radical wing of the um, of the Congress party in so far as Gandhi was the one leading the way. And once, like, it would have been interesting how their relationship would have developed if Patel would have lived longer, because we have Gandhi, who dies very soon after partition, and then um, Patel, who um, follows um, um, a year later. So it would have been really interesting to see how Patel would have handled and managed um, um, his relationship with Nehru if it wasn't for the constant interventions of Gandhi, who told him that, you know, he's my um, um, handpicked guy, so, you know, be nice to him. So I do think that that is something um, that I took away, is that without that relationship, it was a very dysfunctional relationship that both of them had. Um, with, of course, Nehru's flirtations with internationalism in a way that Badil, as a sort of um, nationalist in the sense that he thought national sovereignty was the key thing um, that defined a nation state um, could have uh, could have played out in all, all kinds of different ways. Mm. 
to put them on i was you know one of the letters that sardar patel writes struck me because it was almost like somebody was talking about the situation as it stands now where he said i have tried to produce this correspondence with regards to the chinese uh, government mm-hmm. uh but i regret to say that neither of them comes out well as a re- result of this study the chinese government have tried to delude uh, us delude us i beg your pardon by professions of peaceful intentions um is it almost like history looping itself over again when when you know when you look at that correspondence when you look at the missteps that occurred at that point to the here and now um i think uh, it was it, it there are parallels but uh, yeah, we, no, I'm we, we should be, <laughs> there are there are parallels but we should be uh, we do have to be careful because what was happening then was that there was a very strong i mean um there was a practical component all, at one point so there were limited limitations to the material strength that india had that it could bring to bear against the chinese which still exist but um there were also ideological limitations so a lot of this um a lot of what went on had to do with um nehru's own sort of commitment to socialist internationalism uh to being to being and to being seen to be being uh, a kind of global anti-colonial leader uh and um the use i guess of nehru's uh, larger than life uh stature as as a kind of substitute for the material constraints that india faced so um those constraints uh are no longer uh applicable so if anything uh there should be a clearer uh, uh you know clear identification of uh where things stand of what india's conception of itself vis-a-vis china and vis-a-vis the rest of the world is because the fight between nehru and patel happens at one point it's just about the chinese but at another level it's also about how uh, india conceives of itself so for patel india is very much uh it supposed to embrace its heritage as the kind of successor state uh to the british raj with its legal persona its legal obligations uh, and its claims because ultimately what's uh, with things like aksai chin etc is um uh, even for the british raj their claims because they're not acknowledged uh, by the chinese um and for nehru there's a kind of break because you 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 uh, you know independence represents a kind of dividing line uh where there's going to be a new uh, you know new future which uh, not just for him uh, but also crucially you know whenever for for southeast asia anything socialism will provide that kind of bridge uh, that will really allow for uh, for a kind of common understanding um across uh, across asia so let me ask you this. just to um mitali just to jump in on that point because i do think that it like a little like if we put a little more stress on it i think it will become more clear so nehru comes to power and both the soviets and the chinese are thinking that well mm-hmm. india is now independent and nehru is prime minister but essentially it's just a continuation of colonialism so nothing has really changed this is a trick that the western capitalist powers are playing on the eastern asian nations so that's how they conceive of india's independence and therefore nehru goes three steps further in order to really show them that um he's no longer under the influence of the west so that also explains some of his um some of his policies um his constant um um pandering to, uh, towards china and to, and towards the soviets and also his socialist policies that even though he sees that they're failing and consistently failing he just sticks by them because he fears that once he moves towards the west um all of what he considers eyes allies um will immediately say that well we told um we knew that you you were never fully independent it was always just a trick that capitalist powers yeah. are sort of playing on us mm. so let me ask you both this before we move to you know the the, the last part of uh, your book i know that the stress for you is to talk about how there was this much open debate and dialogue between leaders of the time which is solely lacking at this point in time but did you get the sense that um you know regardless of the quality of debate nehru was getting the upper hand to the detriment of the country whether it was foreign policy or whether it was discussing you know the importance of religion or representation do you feel that despite the debate um there were wrongs that were occurring because that that is the allegation as it stands uh, at this point in time uh, adil if you want to start and then triputam i mean look the the allegation is of course true but what i really like to do when i 
com when I compare Nehru and his relationship with the constitution, Nehru and his interventions into free speech, freedom of expressions, and all of these things, is to um, pit him against other um, nationalist leaders who brought their countries um, out of the shackles of colonialism. And many of those leaders turned outright um, authoritarian, um, binned their constitutions and declared themselves dictators, right? So this is the story really that happens in, in Africa. This is the story that happens in um, much of Asia and Southeast Asia. So Nehru's um, clamping down on specific things, I always... Um, think we should read in that sort of broader context. And in that broader context, he's faring fairly well, right? Because he did um, curb um, freedoms um, and he didn't live up to the sort of high, um, to the high level that the, const that the constitution promised. But at the same time, he also didn't fall into the same pits as other leaders did, especially the um, anti-colonial heroes and nationalist leaders that all these countries have. So I do think that if we read it from that perspective, Nehru did okay-ish um, regarding the preserving of the constitutional purity. Super Daman, for you. Uh, I think you're right that he is gaining the upper hand. I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. So there's the argument that Adil makes, and then there's the kind of argument that old school Marxists like, uh, like Perry Anderson make, uh, which is to flip uh, the position on his head and say, well, the reason that he didn't slip uh, into, uh, you know, into, uh, into the same um, you know, position as, uh, as people like you know, Sokarno and Nkrumah and, uh, and all of these guys was because he didn't have any challenges. So there was no real incentive uh, to, uh, to kind of push the authoritarian envelope beyond a point because uh, he was already getting most of what he wanted. Uh, and plus the kind of uh, posi his position as a democratic leader, except. Um, etc. were crucial to his uh, to his global stature, which he would not have had if he had uh, uh, if he had you know decided to bin the constitution and uh, become dictator for life, which he could easily have done. And it's a very it's a big plus point in his favor that he didn't. But um, when you say that he he kind of gains the upper hand in debates, uh, he does. But that's also part and parcel of why these debates happen because he's conscious uh, that he has to in a way like. At some point, at one level, he's he, they're just discussing a kind of philosophical or ideological position. But at another, this is also a public performance, uh, and it's a public performance to stake out their position, to mark out their territory, and to uh, build political alliances. And in this, Nehru is actually turns out to be a very, very uh, good political player because he manages, in a way, to maintain working relationships across uh, with Gandhi's support. Gandhi is very much essential to it, and he's very good at using Gandhi's support for that. To um, uh, you, if you compare Nehru with someone like Bose, for example, who's just completely unable to manage uh, working relationships with the Congress right. So actually, while people often say, uh, "Yes, you know." Um, Gandhi had Bose kicked out and so on and so forth, which he did, but Bose was also completely unable to manage uh, his own personal relationships with other Congress figures, especially those not uh, in the radical faction. And Nehru proves very, very adept at that game. And part of the reason why he proves very adept at it is his willingness to engage in these very public, uh, very oftentimes it can be seen almost as performative uh, debates and engagements. Um, and they really kind of help uh, cement uh, cement that position. So let me come to the last uh, the last conversation, which I think is really something we're all living through right now in India, uh, which is around the constitution and how the, how far you can push the envelope. But I think what I found interesting in in what you all wrote is when you profile both Nehru and Mukherjee, and you talk about the position that Nehru articulated, the curbing of civil liberties, including free speech in pursuit of a progressive and socialist government agenda, actually belies his current genteel liberal image, whereas Mukherjee's passionate defense of individual liberty and constitutional morality, etc., is actually is, is a far cry from, you know, the, the kind of not caricature, for lack of a better word, but, you know, the aura that's been built around him. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you struck by that? Uh, you know, the, the, the big, the way they have both been sort of pushed into these two silos, which was clearly not the case? Very much so, very much so. And uh, not only, 
th that's one of the reasons why we wrote this book is this is again, um, interpreters and interlocutors uh, often use um, use them as fronts to kind of, uh, you know, make a normative point, which is what we didn't uh, want to do. And this really uh, typifies uh, typifies what, uh, what we argue in the introduction uh, in that these people often had, uh, first they were complex individuals, but also their ideas have really, not often been represented um, in in a very kind of fair way. And this is one of them, Mukherjee, for example, of course you read the arguments that he presented in his speech in this book, but apart from that, Mukherjee was also president of the All India Civil Liberties Conference, a kind of uh, a leading proponent of opposition to the First Amendment, which he carried on for a long time. Uh, and a leading proponent also of getting rid of sedition uh, from the statute books of, uh, uh, of kind of really uh, really articulating a, a kind of very classical liberal position, you know, not out, out of the old Whig playbook almost. Yeah. And Nehru, in a way, articulates something that's, uh, as, as Adil would remember, I would, um, I would Professor Chris Bailey would always say Nehru was a communitarian liberal, which is that he was a communitarian first. Uh, and liberalism came a kind of very uh, far second um, to it. So yeah. if anything, the modern Indian liberal owes much more to the tradition that S.P. Mukherjee represented and others, there's, uh, there was a whole host of Indian liberals, Kunzru, Sapru, yeah. uh, you know, Zafrullah Khan and so on. Uh, uh, and that is the true Indian liberal tradition. The Indian liberal tradition really doesn't draw on Nehruvianism because uh, Nehruvianism was anything uh, but classical liberalism. Yeah. Um, Adil, what stood out in this interaction for you? I mean, TDS has summarized all of the points, so there's very, very little to add, but maybe just like a little bit in defense of Nehru is that the big problem that Nehru saw facing India was poverty, right? And he mm -hmm. thought he had a solution in order to alleviate poverty, and that solution was socialism. So once he had that answer, then everything else became secondary, right? And the classic liberal um, rights that we have, the classic constitutionalism didn't really play the same role when he, in his mind, had formed the opinion that in order to get rid of poverty and push 90% of the Indian population out of abject poverty, he had to you know, make these sort of radical um, transformations, um, then everything, everything else didn't really matter that much to him anymore. Mm. And we can say about it what, what we want, like, did it work, did it not work? I think it didn't work. Some people may think it did. But um, essentially, it explains why Nehru's liberalism isn't um, easily captured. Okay. No, and to be, sorry, just to jump in for a quick minute, uh, to be perfectly fair to Nehru, he also doesn't hide it. You know, he says it openly. He said it openly in the Constituent Assembly, and he says it openly in the context of uh, uh, the debate over the First Amendment as well, that actually there's only one problem that is to, you know, clothe the naked millions and feed the, uh, you know, starving, um, starving population. And to him, that is the true purpose of the Constitution. So the Constitution, even when it was formed, has this inherent tension between uh, does it, is it a vehicle for, uh, uh, for the social revolution that Nehru has in mind, or is it a vehicle for the protection of liberty and freedom? And this kind of tension never really goes away. And the First Amendment kind of is what shapes. Then there comes this, this decisive moment, uh, and you know, in in that Nehru lines up on one side, which is obviously the social revolutionary side, uh, and then Mukherjee lines up um, on the other, which is uh, individual liberty and freedom. Okay. Uh, but Nehru is also in a way capturing the kind of zeitgeist uh, because his uh, socialism was also the flavor of the season. So every anti-colonial leader was socialist. Uh, everyone in the third world was socialist. That was very much a kind, uh, uh, it wasn't him, uh, it wasn't him just picking it out of a hat. Yeah. Okay, so one uh, very quick final question because we're almost out of time. Tripudaman, I noticed a tweet that you responded to about how there's been an intellectual slide from the time of Nehru to the current times that we live in. And your response was not really, it's been flatlining except for the outlier, which might have been uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Are you saying uh, we overstate the intellectual abilities of our first prime minister? Or are you saying that we understate the intellectual abilities of our current prime minister? Uh... 
No, I think we overstate the intellectual abilities of the first prime minister, but we also crucially understate his abilities as a political operator and a, and, and a politician. I think we what we do is in the sense of glorifying the founding figures and establishing uh, these sort of nationalist myths, which are crucial, right? They're crucial to nationalist mythography is crucial to establishing a nation. We, uh, we know that and we need it, but... Um, Got Essentially, it. that was that was my point. He wasn't uh, to treat him as an, and that's important to these debates as well. We treat them not just as intellectual engagements, but also as you know, uh, public performance of politics. Yeah, which is um, what it is. Yeah, Nehru. We, I mean, when comparing Nehru and 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 uh, and the current prime minister, it's also useful to remember uh, Nehru had huge advantages. He went to Harrow. He went to Trinity. It gave him uh, the confidence to you know. Uh, be a part of the global elite, uh, fluency with the English language, a kind of aesthetic sensibility, uh, and appreciation for literature and art, etc., which was very much came from his upbringing and education. Yeah, but I think now now we're playing on the reverse card with, uh, uh, you know, um, we have a problem with all those things now. So that is also working to yeah. the advantage of the establishment. Adil, you know, quick two minute uh, take from you if you'd like to. I mean, if we if we really compare um, the current prime minister to 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 Nehru, I do think the crucial thing is that both of them spent most of their life as th within the party system. Both of them had completely devoted their life to the party system, and they rose through the ranks in those party systems. So, be it somebody like Nehru who started off, you know, as um, um, as a consultant to various reports that the uh, Congress Party um, um, was conducting in the thirties to literally president of the party. And then both of these men remade their parties in their own image. So there's a lot of similarity in the ways in which they operated as political figures. In terms of intellectual capabilities, like that's a, I don't think anyone can sort of um, go there and comment on it, but both were very intelligent men who um, accomplished a great many things. Okay, gentlemen, we'll leave it there. Uh, very fun chatting with you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on your book. Um, and I hope that it spreads well and is read well uh, as the months go by. Thank you very much for joining in. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mitali. Thank you so us. much, Mitali. Get a sneak peek of exclusive content before everyone else for channel members only. Memberships start at Rs. 89. Hit the join button below.